so we're talking about dreams very fascinating subject why do we dream what does it mean uh, from a jewish perspective of course dream interpretation maybe dream prophecy can our dreams tell us about the future let's see so the first question is why do we dream even just from a scientific perspective why do we dream why do we need to dream so i'll, I'll post a link later to this nice short video from ted ed about different theories for why we dream because nobody really knows for sure why we dream there's some ideas we know that dreaming is necessary we need dreaming to survive which we'll talk about soon but why why do we dream so some people think that one theory is that it's the brain doing its thing at night while you're sleeping the brain is reorganizing itself shuffling some information around deleting what it doesn't need from the course of the day all the sensory information that you took in over the course of the day the brain is going to decide what should it keep what it should it get rid of delete stuff copy stuff move things around so the brain is reorganizing and while it's doing that perhaps you're getting all kinds of images flashing things that happened over the course of the day and that's just like popping in your head while you sleep. So that's that's one idea. Another idea, more from like a biological evolutionary perspective, is perhaps there's some kind of train that you're you're dreaming is a way to teach you about certain stressful situations because dreams can sometimes be or can often be stressful. So why is that from an evolutionary perspective? Why would dreams need to be stressful? So perhaps it's to train us to deal with stressful situations. So maybe you've dreamt about running away from a lion and then in real life you were presented with this, a similar situation and you know how to, you've had some kind of experience with it perhaps in your dreams before. That's another theory. Another one, maybe it's just your dreaming is just a screensaver while your brain is reorganizing itself or cleaning itself up at night and while you're asleep, your body is recharging, doing its thing, repairing itself and uh, your brain is highly active but to keep you entertained it puts on like a little screensaver like on your computer that's another theory there's all kinds of theories but nobody knows for sure why it is that we dream we do know for sure that you need to dream because if you don't dream it can actually be fatal i like this one study that i found that showed actually calculated that for every five percent reduction in rem sleep there was a 13% increase in mortality rate. So it's pretty serious. REM, remember, is rapid eye movement. That's the part of sleeping when, when most of the dreams occur. It's like the deepest part of sleep. So if uh, for every 5% reduction in, in dreaming, essentially, a person has a 13% higher chance of mortality. And another, this is a, an interesting paper here about uh, not sleep deprivation, but dream deprivation. It says many of the health concerns attributed to sleep loss result from a silent epidemic of REM sleep deprivation. So it's more of a dream loss. So the dream loss is an unrecognized public health hazard that silently wrecks havoc with our lives, contributing to illness, depression, and an erosion of consciousness. So there's something really serious about dream, something really important, and we cannot live without a dream. I can't survive without dreaming. Everybody needs to dream, and it's healthy to dream. And the Talmud actually told us this a very long time ago. So there's a section of the Talmud, very famous, to several pages devoted to dreaming in Masechet Brachot, called Perek Haroe. And it starts by saying this, or at least at the, towards the beginning, it says the statement that uh, that there's three things that need constant prayer for, and they are Melech Tov, a good king, a good government, Shana Tova, a good year, Bechalom Tov, and a good dream. There's three things that a person needs to pray for regularly to have a good blank. You have to pray that you have a good government, that you have a good year, that you have a good dream. And when it says about having a good dream, uh, for each one of these, it brings, as, it, as the Gemara often does, it brings a proof, a scriptural proof from a verse in Tanakh. And when it comes to dreaming, it's, it uses the verse from Isaiah that says, So the verse in the simple reading, the pshat reading of the verse just means that God will heal me and I will live. Achlama is, means healing, but the root, we know that Hebrew is a divine language. Everything is precise in Hebrew, right? Every root is connected to every similar sounding word, similar root. There has to be some connection there. And the root of healing 
Achlama and the root of dreaming, Chalom is the same. So our sages say, why is that the same? Because dreaming is healing. And, and you can read this verse a different way, not with the Chalimani, with the Chayani, meaning that God will heal me and I will live, but I will dream and I will live. That as long as I'm dreaming, I will stay alive. Right? So dreaming is important for our health. It keeps you alive. Right? So dreaming is, is a vital activity that we all need to participate in. Now, if we go to just focus on this passage for a second, it's a really important one because, you know, when you're learning Gemara, of course, you have to ask the important questions. Like when you see this statement, there's three things that need to constantly be prayed for. We pray for all kinds of things. There's three things that our sages say we need to pray for. A good government, you know, a good king, a good year, and a good dream. What's the connection? Like, what do these three things have to do with each other? Why these three? Why not other things? What is the message here? But what is the connection between these three things that we need to specifically pray for these all the time? So if we look at Rashi for some help, Rashi was, of course, the foremost Talmudic commentator who lived around a thousand years ago. Rashi says, uh, why, why, do we, what are these, why do we need to pray for these three specifically? Uh, so, so we want these things to come, to have a good government, a good year, a good dream, because they are in God's hands specifically. That God is in charge of these three things specifically. We know that God gave us free will. He kind of lets the world run its course, generally speaking. But there are three things that are strictly in his hands that he is in charge of. God appoints governments. Uh, God determines if a year will be good or bad, and God is in charge of dreams. That's what Rashi says. And uh, on that note, I think it's important to, to put in a political bit here because it's a really interesting point here that Rashi is saying, and a lot of our sages said the same thing, that governments are appointed by Hashem. Right? It comes from above, really. So we get a little bit caught up in politics. Who's going to be the next president, prime minister, this party, that party? Right? But really, it's all coming from heaven. Right? The Zohar is a very powerful thing. Actually, on last week's Parsha, the Zohar is something really powerful where it says, first, a government is elected in heaven, and then it's elected down below. And so which government is in charge is actually determined in the heavens. And every nation gets the kind of government that it deserves. If you read the Rambam Zilchot Shuvah, he says something very similar between the lines, right? He says, just as every individual is judged, and if he's mostly righteous, he's one way. If he's mostly sinful, he's another way. We go by majority. It's the same thing. The Rambam actually says the same thing on a national level. Right? God judges a nation based on the majority. Is it righteous? Is it sinful? And governments are basically brought depending on what the people deserve, right? The people deserve a good government, they get a good government. If they don't, they don't. So it's important to keep that in mind because we often get too caught up in politics, but we have to remember that ultimately God controls who's in charge, who needs to be in charge at any given time. And as we read the Torah coming up in the next few parshas about the pharaohs and how God hardened their hearts and so on, that God limits the free will when it comes to certain politicians, people in really important positions of power. A lot of that is actually God guiding the world forward. Okay, so it's in God's hands. So we're actually saying there's three things that are in God's hands, the type of government that's going to be there and the type of year that we're going to have, because we know in Rosh Hashanah, God determines what kind of year it will be. And a good and dreaming as well. All these three things come from from Hashem. That's what Rashi says. But the Ben Ishchai says something different. The Ben Ishchai says, one of the great uh, sages, the Mizrahi sages, Fardi, Mizrahi, Iraqi sages, the last century, he had also, he has a commentary also on the Talmud, Ben Yo Yada. So he says there, he says, Pirush Rashi, so he quotes Rashi, he says, Rashi says that it's because these things are in God's hands. But he's saying, no, he's saying, seems to be that it should be the opposite way. He says, really, it would be the opposite way. Like if these things are in God's hands, then why do we need to pray for them all the time? It's in God's hands. What am I going to, I'm going to change God's mind about this. So he explained, he says, really, if it was, if it was, there was some agent that God appointed instead, if there were angels in charge of these things, then maybe we could pray and hopefully God will change the, the angels, guide them in different directions. Uh, but that's not the case. If it's in God's hands, what do we need to pray for it? 
So he's saying, no, he thinks that there's, he gives a different idea. He says, why do we need to pray for them all the time? So he's saying that these are things that we sometimes see that they start well, and then we falsely believe that they're going to continue well. So he's saying that, that like he sees at the beginning, a person sees at the beginning is good, and then they're going to think that now it's always going to be good. And he's saying, don't think that now everything is going to go smoothly. You have to constantly pray for it. So he's giving an example, like, right? Like if the year starts off really well for you and you think, oh, great, this is going to be such a good year. So the Ben is saying, no, 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 not so fast, right? Don't rush. You still have to pray for a good year because things can change really quickly. And the same is true, he says, for a government. Right? How many times do people get duped into voting for a particular government thinking that's it, this is going to be the greatest government ever, the greatest president ever, the greatest leader ever, and then what happens? And then they turn out to be just like every other crooked politician. So and that's what the Ben Ishai is saying too. Bechen bemelech nirat chilatoto, right? This particular king sounds so great at the beginning, uh, but then you don't know. And very often a good government turns into a really bad government. So that's why you always have to pray, keep praying for a good government, that God will ensure that we have good leaders for us and pray for a good year and pray for good dreams. Uh, because just because a dream started out well or just because you had a good dream doesn't mean that for sure everything is going to be good now. You have to follow up with it and constantly pray and continue that the dream will be realized in a good way and so on. So that's that little interesting passage. We, we said, why do we dream? We, we looked at some scientific possibilities from a Jewish perspective, from a mystical perspective, why do you need to dream? And the Zohar says a lot about dreaming and a lot about sleeping, dreaming, and what we do. In one place, it says, When people go to sleep, what happens? That their souls leave their bodies, okay, and they go up to heaven, and so they actually bear witness that they actually have to give an accounting of what they did that whole day. And uh, we know that you're, we talked about this before, that there are various levels to your soul. And the lowest level is the nefesh, which is associated with just the basic life force, your blood. And, and then you have your ruach and the shama and chaya, yechida. There are different levels of soul. And the lowest level of soul, like the bottom nefesh, the animalistic part of your soul always stays in your body and that keeps you alive. If that leaves and the person's dead. So when a person's sleeping, they're almost in like a, almost like a death-like state uh, because most of their soul has left their body and only the lowest level of soul remains to keep them alive. And the rest of the soul goes up to heaven, it's traveling, going all over in other places. And maybe that's why we can sometimes get prophetic dreams, as we'll see. So only the lowest level of soul remains in the body, and the higher levels move out and, and travel all over the place. And they go to heaven, and they give an accounting of what happened that day, which might be why we often dream about things that we saw that day, or dream about things, events, or things we've heard in that day. In another place, the Zohar says, uh, that the, every night, the souls specifically of the righteous people go up to heaven. Uh, and at midnight or at a certain time at night, uh, that he comes to the Garden of Eden, in the heavenly Garden of Eden, that he comes to delight with the souls of the righteous. So there's this beautiful idea in Judaism that God sends these souls down into earth, down into physical form. They're kind of separate from God for a certain amount of time. And God misses us. God misses our souls. So every night we go to sleep and our souls go up to heaven to be with God a little bit so that he can spend a little time with us and delight with us before we come back to earth and do start a new day, kind of detached, seemingly detached from God. So it's like a spiritual uh, revival. So when a person's sleeping, it's not so much for the body. And we know scientifically that sleeping, the body doesn't really need to sleep. And the body doesn't really sleep. It's always very active. It's the, the brain, the body, your body's still working pretty hard while you sleep. So it's not really resting. And from a scientific perspective, sleep is hard to explain, especially from like, from an evolutionary perspective, it's a big challenge because why would a person waste a third of their life in this dormant state? It's a very dangerous thing. You're like out of it, right? You're, 
basically unconscious, we can say, uh, you are exposed, you could be attacked by predators or whatever. It doesn't really make sense biologically to devote so much time to sleeping. And the body is still very active while we sleep. So sleep is not so much for the body as it is for the soul. Okay? And we see that dreaming is something that you need to dream to stay alive. You need that REM sleep or it could be fatal. So it's more about the soul than it is about the body. That's what we need to understand here. That sleeping, dreaming is a very deeply spiritual thing. And it can in another, in yet another place, the Zohar talks about this in many, many different places. And at each place, it adds something uh, different. So here it says also that when a person sleeps, when a person goes to bed, then actually here it gives a piece of advice. It's saying before that, before as a person goes to sleep, what should they do first? Uh, before you go to sleep, take upon yourself the yoke of heaven, kind of crown God, right? Take, take upon yourself your strength and your faith in, in, in Hashem, crown God as king. And after that, say some verses, mercy verses from the Tanakh, like we do. We say before we go to bed, there's a whole procedure, right? There's we say Shema before we go to bed, and before that, there's a certain like a vidui, a confession, and we say certain verses. So we're like asking for mercy. We're saying verses of mercy, and why do we do that? Uh, begin because we know your soul goes up to heaven. And it's going all over the place. And each soul according to, so it's, it's going above, in its own path, every soul in its own different path. And uh, that a person can receive a vision while they sleep because the, their souls go up to heaven. Then this God can relay to the soul as it's traveling up to the heavens, God can relay to the soul all kinds of information about the future. Okay, so it can give them a, a little bit of prophecy. And that's why there's three stages. The Zohar here says that there are three levels of prophetic capability. Uh, there's like dreaming, which is the lowest level of prophecy. And then you can have like a certain a certain vision, which is a little higher. And then like real prophecy is the highest level. So there's three levels of receiving some kind of divine information. The lowest level is dreaming, which we all do. We're all capable of. We all receive certain bits of prophecy in our dreams. And then above that is a a higher vision. And then above that is full-fledged prophecy. So you go when you go to sleep, your soul or most of your soul leaves the body and is traveling through all kinds of spiritual worlds and picking up all kinds of information. And so it can definitely be a prophetic experience. Okay, how much of the dream is prophecy? So we're going to go back to the Gemara here. And the Gemara says that there are five things, chamisha, that are echad mishishim. There are five things that are a 60th of something else. Okay. Something that's a 60th of something else. Beheluen, so esh, dvash, fire, honey, shabbat, shina, sleeping, vechalom, and dreams. Esh, fire, echad mishishim legenom, is a 60th of the fire that we perceive in this world, that we use in this world, is a 60th of the flames of Gehenom, the flames of hell, if you want, the underworld. Dvash, honey, echad mishishim leman. Honey is a 60th of manna, the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness for 40 years. We know it was super nutritious and healthy and so on and so on. So dvash, honey is like that as well. It's very nutritious. It's, uh, it's a good antibiotic and all kinds of other things. Has a lot of medicinal properties. So honey is a 60th of the perhaps the nutritional value or the sweetness, the deliciousness, the goodness of, of, of mana. And Shabbat is the 60th of the world to come, of the afterlife. We know how delightful Shabbat is, and even still, it's only a 60th of the delights of the afterlife. And Shina Echad Mishishim Lamita, so sleeping is like a 60th of death, which we already mentioned before, because most of your soul leaves your body. Uh, when a person is dead, then basically the entire soul leaves the body and sleep is a 60th of death. So it's almost like a death-like state. And chalom dreams are echad mishishim So it's a 60th of prophecy. 
And so dreams are a 60th, it's like a little hint of prophecy. And we have many examples of prophetic dreams in the Torah, of course. This week's Parsha is one of them, where Yosef is going to dream these things with his brothers, and next week's Parsha with Pharaoh's dreams, and last week or a couple of weeks ago with uh, Yaakov and his dream of the ladder, Sulam, and throughout the Torah and the Tanakh, the dreaming is a very key theme uh, and having a prophetic dream. And we are all capable of that. We all have that 60th of prophecy in our dreams. Most of our dreams are just nonsense, but a 60th is prophecy. And so we're going to go through this uh, Talmudic section on dreams and just go briefly. Uh, I recommend going through it yourself. It's pages 55a to 57b. Go through it in depth with commentary. Really is incredible information over there. I'm just going to pick some of the highlights. And so this is what it says. Most of what you're dreaming is nonsense because it's impossible to have a dream without all kinds of silly things that you've experienced during the day. Your dreams can be influenced by the food you ate. If you eat something spicy, it can cause a certain kind of dream. If you eat meat, it can cause a certain kind of dream. So what your diet can affect your dreams, your, your activity level, what, you, what you've experienced. Obviously, if you watch something, if you listen to a song, all these things affect our dreams. And most of what we dream is, is, has no spiritual value or, or prophetic value. But a 60th does, a little bit does. Uh, so some of our dreams are prophetic. And so we have to kind of learn how to remove the dross, get rid of the stuff that's no good, and find the good stuff. Okay, so that's the the sages use the analogy of balvetevin, that so like wheat and chaff, something like that. So you have to get rid of all the bad stuff and focus on the good stuff. And there are ways to develop your prophetic dream ability. Maybe we'll talk about that. And our sages say one should wait up to 22 years for a dream to be fulfilled. If you do have a prophetic dream, it might take a while. So a person should always wait up to 22 years for a dream to be fulfilled. How do we know? Uh, from Yosef, from Joseph Dichtiv, because we read about that, that the story of Joseph in the Torah starts when he's 17 years old, and that's when he got sold or whatever you want to call it he he was abandoned by his brothers and ended up as a slave in egypt and then he went up the ranks and in egypt and then eventually became like the king over there Mishnela Melech, like the viceroy and that whole process took 22 years so between the time when joseph dreamt when he was 17 years old he dreamt that he would achieve greatness and all the brothers would bow down to him and the time when that actually happened, and he was the viceroy and the brothers came and bowed down to him, 22 years had elapsed. So from this, our sages learned that it can take up to 22 years for a dream to be fulfilled. And uh, our sages remind us that everybody has to dream. Like we said earlier, it's something that you need to stay alive. Uh, it's not just for entertainment. There's real vitality in dreaming. And uh, so anybody who goes seven days without dreaming is considered wicked. He's a wicked person. It's a bad sign. If you've gone seven days without dreaming, that's no good. It's a sign that something's going on. You got to do tshuva or something because everybody needs to dream. Of course, most people forget their dreams and that's okay. Uh, but we all, sh we all are dreaming. And hopefully we can at least remember something once in seven days. And again, he uses a proof from the Tanakh, from a scriptural verse, Shanaimal. It says in, in Proverbs in Mishlei, uh, the verse, the full verse is Yerat Hashem Lechaim. And it says, yelin bali pakedra, that a person who fears God can go to bed, you know, satisfied, satiated, and will not meet evil. As long as he is, has faith in Hashem, he'll be fine. And Rabbi Zaira says, Al tikre uh, savea, don't read satiated, ela sheva. That like, you can read the same word as meaning seven. And so if you, person who has gone seven days or seven nights, has laid in bed seven nights and hasn't seen a dream, can be called ra, right? like the verse says, can be called wicked. So it's important to dream and everybody has to dream. But dreams can be forgotten. And it's common that people forget their dreams. And so the sages instituted a little prayer. 
uh, you've all probably experienced this, you've all seen it in the Sidur, that in, uh, during the Birkat Kohanim, um, when the priests do the, the, the Kohanim do the priestly blessing, when that priestly blessing happens in between, you've probably seen in the Sidur that there's a prayer there that starts by saying, and so on, that uh, you can read the full, I didn't put the full text here, but it's quite a lengthy little paragraph. Um, to request of Hashem to give you knowledge of your dreams and to help explain your dreams. And if they are good dreams, then they should, it's a prayer that they should materialize and that they should be fulfilled. And if they're bad dreams, that they shouldn't be fulfilled and so on. It's a beautiful prayer. And actually, there's a, there's a very deep mystical connection here between Birkat Kohanim and dreaming. And we said dreaming is a 60th of prophecy. Sleep is a 60th of death. And the whole Birkat Kohanim procedure is actually associated with the number 60. If you think about it, if you delve into it, it's associated with the number 60. The actual blessing itself, the three verses of the Birkat Kohanim has 60 letters. So the priests are reciting something that has 60 letters in it. And in terms of the sign that the Kohanim are making with their hands, there's a few different uh, variations of the sign and a few different opinions of how it's supposed to look like. Some make it, some do it in this kind of way, some do it this way. And there's on the, the most mystical way is to actually do it like this picture shows, which is that they make a letter, uh, a samich with their hands. Why the letter samich? Again, because the letter samich is 60 and samich is this perfect circle. It's a closed, complete letter and it's supposed to represent cycles and blessings and this kind of eternity the circle being this almost like this eternal never-ending shape so that that's the idea of the of the priestly blessing and the connection to the 60 and the connection to the dreaming and dreaming being tied to life so you can piece it all together in your head meditate on these ideas for a little bit um, so that's that's one place where we include a, a prayer for dreaming and to help us to remember our dreams and to help us to understand our dreams and for the dreams to be materialized for the good. What happens when you're dreaming? What do you say after a good dream? What do you say after a bad dream? Okay, so Shmuel. You remember Shmuel? Well, not Shmuel Hanavi. We're not talking about, we're talking about Shmuel the sage who lived about 1800 years ago. He was a student of Rabbi Uda Anasi, and he's one of those two people that Rav and Shmuel were the two, two students of Rabbi Uda Anasi who moved to Babylon and who helped find some of the big Babylonian schools that produced the, the Talmud Bavli, this, where we're getting all this information from. And so Rabbi Uda Anasi, just a quick recap, was the one who's credited with writing, recording the Mishnah and kind of starting this Talmudic process or putting it down on paper for the first time. And two of his students, Rabbi Yudha Anasi was Anasi means he was the president of Israel at the time. And his two of his students, Shmuel and Rav, ended up going to Bavel and establishing Torah academies over there about 1800 years ago. So Shmuel, Ki Chalma Bisha, when he would see a bad dream, he would say, he would quote the verse from Zechariah, which says, V'chalomot hashavi dabeu, that dreams are just nonsense. They just speak false stuff. So they mean nothing. So if Shmuel woke up and he had a bad dream, he would say this verse. Ah, right? It's like, it doesn't mean anything. Dreams are nonsensical. But if he would wake up, when he would wake up from a good dream, he saw a good dream, what would he say? Amal. He would say, he would change the intonation. He would say, Is it really? Are they really nonsensical? But isn't it written? Then he would quote the verse from Numbers, from, uh, from Bamidbal that God is saying that he speaks to people through dreams. This section in, in uh, Bamidbal is when Aaron and Miriam bring up a little complaint against Moses. I don't know if you remember that story. And God then comes to them and says, are you criticizing Moshe that he's like my number one, my go-to guy? He says, you know that because they, Miriam and Aaron were saying, listen, we're prophets too. And then God and said, yeah, yeah, you're all prophets. But with you guys, I speak to you in dreams. But Moshe is the only one that I speak to face to face, that he's awake. So that's why actually one reason why the prophecy of Moshe was greater than any other prophet. One of the 13 principles of faith is that Moshe is unique among prophets. His prophecy is different than any other prophet. There was none other like him. 
because Moshe was the only one in history who could speak to God in an awake state. He was fully lucid and awake and conscious when he communicated with God. Every other prophet communicated with God only in a trance, in a dream. And so that's, that's what it was saying here. But Moshe was unique in that he could prophesy without dreaming. All the other prophets were basically in a dream or in a trance. And so Shmuel, when he would have a good dream, he would recite the verse that says, God speaks to us in dreams. And when he would have a bad dream, he would recite the verse that says, ah, dreams don't mean anything anyways. Okay. And then uh, Rava, he was saying, Rami Kativ bo. he's saying, listen, we have a contradiction here. On the one hand, you have a verse that says, bo, that I speak to people in dreams, God is saying. But then another verse says, that dreams are meaningless. So how do we reconcile? He says, Lokashia. It's not a contradiction. Why? So one is talking about angels. One's talking about demons. I don't like the word demons, but maybe good angels and bad angels. So he's saying that good dreams, prophetic dreams, come through the hand of the good angels. And bad dreams, negative dreams, they come through the demons or the bad angels. So I don't like using the word demons because it implies... Um, a different kind of philosophy that assumes that there's kind of two separate realms in the universe, right? Like this dualistic view of the universe where there's the good and the evil and they're constantly fighting each other and competing for souls or something. And these are like against the Shem or whatever. Um, and that's not really a Jewish view, right? The Jewish view is that there's just God is in control of everything. There's no, nothing can really go against God. And God is, God runs everything. And God created the realm of evil as well. He did that because it was necessary to maintain the balance of the universe for whatever reason. There is this illusion of evil that had to be put into the universe. And God is in control of that too. So we don't, Judaism does not have, it's a really important distinction between Judaism and certain other religions that are dualistic, that believe in two separate realms that are competing or that are head to head. Judah, the Jewish view is that God is in charge of everything. God is infinite, all powerful. There's nothing that is outside of his supervision. And that's, there's a verse in Isaiah that we recite. Really, we recite it every day, but our sages just changed it a little bit. But it goes that God is saying, we say this in our prayers, that God is Yotzer O, create light, right? Yotzer O, bore choshech, ose shalom, ubore. In our prayers, we say ubore etakot. But that's not the verse. The actual verse in Isaiah is, I make light and I make darkness, or I form light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. And then it, in case you were confused or in case you were doubting, the verse continues and says, Ani Hashem osekol ele. So just in case you were wondering if God really meant it, right? The verse is saying, I am God. I form light. I form, I create darkness. I, I bring peace and I create evil. And then he reiterates and he affirms what he's saying. He says, Ani Hashem, I am God. I do all these things. Don't think for a moment that there's some other force outside of me in this universe that can rebel against me or like whatever. It's nonsense. And so there's just one God, one power that we have to have faith in, and that's it. And so uh, that's why, just as a little aside, why I don't like the word shed, because really there's kind of good angels and bad angels, but everything's under God's supervision. Okay, and this is really important now about dreams. All dreams are fulfilled based on their interpretation. All dreams come true if you want them to, based on how they're interpreted, based on what you believe about them. So it says this passage about uh, Rabbi Bana. So what happened to Rabbi Bana? In those days, there were 24 different dream interpreters, professional dream interpreters in Jerusalem. One time he had a dream. And Rabbi Bana went to each one of these 24 people to get their opinion. Okay. So they each gave him a different interpretation. Each one of these 24 gave him a different interpretation. Okay. All of them came true. 
all 24 different interpretations came true. And this, I mean, this is to affirm the statement of our sages that kol achalomot olchim achar ape, that all dreams go, are interpreted, are realized based on their interpretation, based on the achar ape, literally how they are interpreted, how the, you speak them into existence, achar ape. And we have proof for this, again, a scriptural proof, because we always want to support what we say from the Torah. How do we know that all dreams go according to the mouth? Because, like it says in the Torah with Joseph, if you remember that Joseph interpreted the dreams for the two uh, servants of Pharaoh in the prison, and they came true. Right? And the way they said it, if you read the verse carefully, they said, the way he interpreted it for us, that's how it was. So when we read it on the pshat level, this verse, like the simple reading is, well, he's a great dream interpreter. Like he's a prophet because we told him our dreams and he interpreted it. And it was true. The way he interpreted it, that's what happened. But the deeper meaning there is not like he knew what the future would be. It's that he created their future. Right? The way he interpreted it, Kenaya, that's what happened. That became the reality. You see this distinction there? It's not that Yosef had foresight. I mean, he probably did, but it's not that foresight that Yosef had foresight and saw the future and told them what will happen. He interpreted it and that created their future. He created their reality. That's the idea. While we're here, just as an aside, uh, I mentioned the Ben Ishchai already, and he comments on these words uh, just as a tip if, if we're talking about how to become a good dreamer. If you want to become a really good dreamer, a lucid dreamer, and to remember your dreams and uh, to receive more prophetic dreams. One, the Ben Ishai actually has something beautiful here. He says, what does it mean? Why did our sages phrase it by saying, that all the uh, dreams go according to the mouth? Why did they phrase it so strangely? Because there's something interesting. We know that there's three things, three main ways that we interact with the world. One is thought, one is speech, and one is action. Yeah, there's thought, speech, and action. Thought is in your brain. Right? So the Ben Ishai says thought is moach, it's your brain. Speech is your mouth, right? Pe. And action is with your hands. So you have your brain, your mouth, your hands. So when he says, Kol one of the meanings there is you have your thought, then you have your mouth, right? If you think about it first, then you speak it. Right? So then that brings the dream to life. First, your dream was in your thoughts. Then you speak it, you make it real. But then to really make it real, you got to do step three. You got to go acharape. What comes after the mouth? What's acharape? The yadain, the hands, the action. So he actually gives a little, I don't know if recommendation there, but he says of, of writing your dreams. Okay, and it's something really powerful that if you actually record your dreams, if you wake up in the morning and you still remember some glimpses of your dreams before you forget them all 10 minutes later, write them all down. Like have a little book next to your bed and write your dreams down. And it's amazing what, what will happen. Eventually, when you do this for a really long time, you start to really remember your dreams better and better and better. Uh, maybe it tells your brain that this is important to you if you're going to keep, keep writing it down. And then you're going to start getting glimmers of prophecy and you won't even, like sometimes you won't realize it. So I'll share a story with you. Uh, I used to do this all the time, many, many years ago. I don't do this anymore. Uh, but long before, when I wasn't married, I would record all my dreams every day, every morning. And that's it. And like, I would never, like, I had like dozens of these little journals with dreams in them. And uh, one time when I was already with my wife, I was walking, we were outside on a walk. And suddenly I had like this total deja vu. I'm like, I've seen this before. Like, you know, you, we've all experienced this, right? Like, I, I'm certain that I dreamt this. You know, we were just walking, just like a stroll one evening or whatever. And I just, everything seemed so familiar. I'm like, I'm sure I dreamt this. So then I came home and then I start, I took out all those old dream journals and I started leafing through them. And I'm like, I'm sure I can find this in one of my dreams. And I was looking, looking, looking. And eventually I found from like years before that I had dreamt of, a, before we were even together, before I even, I really didn't even know who she was. I just briefly knew of her. And I had a dream where I actually wrote. It was like surprising for some reason. 
my wife was who was not yet my wife but this girl was in my dreams and and this was the dream that we were like walking we we're holding hands it was cute whatever and it was just strange it was such a strange dream right like why would i dream about this person out of the blue like it was just totally random but i had recorded it and then a few years later it had happened and when i went back it had come true and it was totally out of my mind like it was just it just came from nowhere like three years later so that that's the kind of thing that can happen really amazing that you can go back if you have them recorded you can actually go back and prove it that you actually had a prophetic dream so that's just a tip from the benish high and something that we also know today more from a scientific perspective that if you record your dreams you'll become a better dreamer and then um the zohar adds to this and it's not just in the zohar our sages said it and it's a bunch of places it says yosef halom like we're going to read this in this week's parsha that he told them what happened and then because he told them his dreams they kind of hated him for it because his dreams were you know kind of megalomaniacal that he they thought that he was going to rule over them so from here we learn our sages say that you should only tell your dreams you should only relate your dreams to somebody who you are very close with somebody who loves you somebody who you know that if you tell them your dream they're going to interpret it to you in a good way so even if you tell them a nightmare because they like you they're going to say ah don't worry it really just means it probably means something good and they're going to interpret it in a good way and then it'll be realized in a good way and the Zohar here actually says something really incredible again it says this whole idea of dreams go according to how they're interpreted so the Zohar says who created that reality that Yosef would rule over his brothers the Zohar says the brothers did so the Zohar points out something really amazing and you can ch check this out when you read the Torah this week that all Yosef did was tell his brothers his dream he didn't interpret it he just told them, this is what I dreamt with the stars, with the sheaves. And they're the ones, the brothers were the ones that said, oh, so you're going to rule over us then. Right? They interpreted the dream. He never did. He never told them, I'm going to rule over you. He just told them, hey, guys, listen, I had this crazy dream. He told them the dream. They were the ones that said, oh, look at this guy. He thinks he's so great. He's going to rule over us. So the Zohar says something amazing. He says, who created that reality? Who created that future that Yosef would rule over his brothers? The brothers did. Because they interpreted it that way. Think about that. It's, a really, it's an incredible thing. And because they interpreted it that way, it came about that way. Because every, every dream is realized according to the interpretation. So that's something to keep in mind here. Okay. Um, now, when you wake up and you recite a verse... So our sages say that's a small level of problem. So when you wake up, and suddenly you wake up with a verse from the Torah in your mouth. This is like a type of prophecy. So you should really think about that. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you have a Torah verse in your head. That's a form of prophecy. So you got to think about what does that mean for your day coming up when you wake up and you have a particular verse stuck in your head. Uh, which dreams are more likely to contain prophecies? So our sages say, okay, So there's three types of dreams that are particularly prophetic and are more likely to come true. So a dream that you have in the morning, and so not in the first part of the night for a number of reasons. Usually the first part of the night, again, you're dreaming about all kinds of nonsense that you experience during the day. By the time it gets to the morning, all that stuff's already out of your head. So the early morning dreams tend to be the most prophetic. Also from like a Kabbalistic perspective, the first half of the night is considered a time of deen, a time of judgment. And then after midnight, it's considered a time of chesed and more positive energy. Uh, so there's also that aspect. So the, the dreams that you have in the early morning, those tend to be more meaningful than dreams that you have er, er, earlier in the night. And the chalom shechalam lo chavero, and a dream that, was dreamt about you by a friend. And so if your friend comes and tells you a dream, that's also very meaningful. Again, out of the blue, right? Like if you dream about your friend because you just spend the whole day with them, then that's probably because you spend the whole day with them. And that's again, your brain reorganizing. But if you suddenly out of the blue, you know, you, you suddenly dream of this person that you haven't maybe spoken to or seen in a while, then that tends to be 
there has to be some kind of meaning there, some kind of prophetic uh, or some, some message that God is trying to send you. Ve'chalom uh, she'niftar that, betochalom, that uh, a dream that, there's two ways to understand this, that was interpreted within the dream, which really means a dream that you had, dreams within dreams. So you had multi-level dreams. So maybe you've experienced this. I'm sure we all have at some point where you, you're dreaming, you wake up, you think you're awake, but you're actually still dreaming, right? And then you wake up again. And sometimes you can have that like three levels, three levels deep, dream within a dream within a dream. So those tend to be also a lot more meaningful. Uh, there's also an opinion that the dream that repeats itself. So repetitive, repeated, recurring dreams are probably also, there's some kind of message God is trying to send you. Again, unless you are constantly stressed about it right if you're dreaming about a particular stressor in your life you might be dreaming about it several nights in a row but that's again that's because it's constantly stressing you out every day so assuming it's not that if you're just having like a random dream that's recurring that's probably has some kind of meaning that you should look into Okay, and dreams are mostly reflections on your own thoughts. As we know, we've said this already, that a person is getting dreams that are coming from the thoughts of their heart, of their head. Things that are going on in their head tend to come out in their dreams. And that's why dream interpretation is actually so useful in psychology and psychotherapy. It's associated really first with Sigmund Freud, but Jews had dream interpretation and psychology going back hundreds of years ago uh freud was really part of came after a, a long line of of rabbis and jewish texts that already discussed this uh and i say here inspired by older jewish books not because his information came from jewish books directly just inspired more broadly i think freud didn't really wasn't really in line with torah and wasn't particular, didn't particularly do a service to the Jewish world. So even though he was Jewish, so I use the word inspired very loosely here, but he knew of this tradition in, of Jewish texts, uh, the, talking about dream interpretation and the connections to psychology. And one of the, probably the most famous book is called Sefer Kiton Chalomot, which goes back about 500 years to Rabbi Shlomo Almoli very famous sage also. And this book was extremely popular. It was already translated into Yiddish hundreds of years ago. So it was really well known. And certainly Freud was aware of it and uh, had gotten some ideas from it. And more than Freud, his contemporary and his, I don't know how it's controversial to say, maybe his protege, his contemporary, his adversary, Carl Jung, you know, those are like the two giant names in psychology, right? Freud, Jung, Freud, Jung. Freud was Jewish, Jung was not, was actually associated with the Nazis at one point, which he somewhat regretted later. Uh, but Jung, even though he was not Jewish, he was kind of obsessed with Judaism, especially at later in his life. And if you read his autobiography called Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, that came out the same year that he died, uh, so he said he had this, he was talking about in 1944, he had a particular issue that he was in the hospital and he had a vision and he writes this, everything around me seemed enchanted. These are his words. At this hour of the night, the nurse brought me some food she had warmed for a time. It seemed to me that she was an old Jewish woman, much older than she actually was, and that she was preparing ritual kosher dishes for me. When I looked at her, she seemed to have a blue halo around her head. I myself was, so it seemed in the Pardesli Monim. That's how he wrote it the garden of pomegranates, and the wedding of Tiferet with Malchut was taking place. Or else I was Rabbi Simon ben Yochai, Shimon bar Yochai, whose wedding in the afterlife was being celebrated. It was the mystic marriage as it appears in the Kabbalistic tradition. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was. So Carl Jung had like this Kabbalistic vision, whatever, and this happened in 1944. And after that, he was really engrossed in mystical studies and so on. And he, he saw himself uh, as a perhaps a reincarnation or a reflection of Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who's the originator of the Zohar. And so uh, he, again, just the idea is that a lot of mainstream, what we would consider secular psychology, psychotherapy, was still actually heavily inspired by Judaism, by mystical texts, by Hasidic texts. He also wrote, uh, actually, I think this is, I don't know if it was in the book, but it's uh, in an interview, he said this, that the Hasidic rabbi Bear from Mizrich, so Dov Bear, the Magid, 
the Magid of Mizrich, whom they call the Great Magid, anticipated my entire psychology in the 18th century. So Carl Jung basically admitted that all his work was already pre-done by the Magid of Mizrich, or the second, after the Baal Shem Tov. He was the disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement. So Carl Jung admitted that all of his, really all his big uh, discoveries in psychology were already long ago discussed and explained in depth by the Hasidic masters. So even a lot of this kind of ideas in secular dream interpretation and psychotherapy actually still come from Judaism, from the Zohar, from the Gemara. Okay, and what you dream about, you think about, so this is like a long story that I, I'm actually gonna skip because we're running out of time. Uh, basically, there's two cases of two kings, a Roman king, a Persian king, that uh, challenged the, the rabbis to say, well, if you are so smart, you know, tell me what I'll dream about. And the rabbis were so smart that they told them something really scary. And then those kings were thinking about it all day. And then when they went to sleep, obviously, they were dreaming about it. And so they proved how, how wise they are. But, but a, a interesting story. You can read it later in depth. And this is where I wanted to close out with this, just different signs. What do different signs mean? So if, you've ha if you're having dreams, what do all those symbols in your dreams mean? So we'll go through some of these. So if you see a well, it's a good sign. It's a sign of peace. And it gives, again, a verse. All these things have a proof from scripture. Why does this particular symbol, what kind of sign it is? Why is it a good sign? And remember, we said that all dreams are interpreted for, uh, all dreams are realized based on how they're interpreted. So we're going to give positive interpretations to everything, even dreams that are, you'll see, I'm not going to go through all the signs, but when you do this yourself later, you'll see that even dreams that seem like, like weird, like, oh, that, that seems like a bad dream. Our sages try to interpret it positively because that's the whole point, right? Like, even if you have a bad dream, you should try to interpret it in a positive way so that it'll turn into something. You create that positive reality. Okay. And then there's three other things that are a sign of peace. Um, so seeing a nahar, a tzipor, and a, and a kadera, that you're seeing a river, it's a sign of peace, it's something good, it's a bird, or a pot. If you're seeing some kind of pot, a cooking pot, and then one opinion says, it's specifically talking about a pot sha'in babasal, that as long as the pot is cooking something without meat. So maybe that's something good for vegans. A good sign that if you're cooking something, but as long as it's not meat, it's a great sign of peace. Okay? If you're seeing a river, if you're seeing a bird, it's a sign of peace. Seeing animals, our sages say, uh, generally, all animals are a good sign. And says, if you see a, an elephant in your dreams, great. That you're going to see miracles and wonders will happen to you because the name of an elephant pil shares very similar sound to pele which is a wonder so you see an elephant you're going to see wonders uh, and if you see pilim if you see multiple elephants even better plie plots you'll see many miracles nasula okay? but then the gemara says no way but we have this other teaching vatanya that kol chayot yafin lechalom all animals in a dream are good chutz min pil umin akof except elephants and monkeys. So anytime you see animals in a dream, that's good. But if you see an elephant and a monkey, then it's not good. So now there's a problem. So they say, no, look, Asha, it's not a contradiction. One elephant, so is an elephant a good sign or a bad sign? Is it going to be wonders or it's not a good sign? So they're saying, well, it depends what kind of elephant. One is, hey, the misrag, hey, the lo misrag. So what it means is, if you see an elephant that is um, saddled, and if you're riding an elephant, that's a different story than seeing maybe a stampede of elephants. That's not so good of a sign. And that book we mentioned by Rabbi al Moli, Piton Chalomot, from 500 years ago. So it, it explains all these things in depth. So it explains this too, that if you see yourself riding an elephant, that's a good sign. Yeah, that means it's a sign of coming success for you. So riding an elephant, all good signs. Uh, all animals are good signs, generally, except maybe a monkey. Okay, what about seeing a cat in your dream? Okay, so I put this one specifically because our last class, we talked about the matrix, and we talked about all the Jewish connections to the matrix, and I didn't include that there, but we're going to add one more Jewish connection to the matrix. 
because our sages say that if you see a cat, the, the Aramaic word for a cat, which is the language, Aramaic is the language of the Gemara, is Shunra. And so they say, listen, there's two pronounced two ways that this, the word is pronounced, depending on where you live in the Persian Babylonian Empire back then. So if you per, live in a place, in a land where they pronounce the word for cat, Shunara, then Na'asitlo Shirana'a, then you'll have, it's a good sign. You'll have some kind of pleasant song, whatever that means. But if you live in a place where they say the word for cat, Shinara, Na'aselo Shinuira, it means the word for a cat is Shinra, which means Shinuira, some kind of bad change. Right? So if you remember the scene in the Matrix where Neo sees the cat and then he sees, oh, and then he sees the same cat and he says, oh, I just had a deja vu. And then everybody freaks out. It's like, what do you mean you had a deja vu? He's like, yeah, I saw a black, you know, the cat walk by and then the same cat walk by. And then they said, that's not good because a deja vu is a glitch in the Matrix and there was some kind of bad change. So they changed the code in the Matrix and then they were all trapped in that building. I don't know if you remember that scene. Uh, and so in the, it's another one of these like interesting little Jewish nuggets in the matrix that when he saw this cat, it was a sign of a bad change, a change in the code of the matrix. And our sage said something uh, similar but different, that seeing a cat in your dream might be a sign of some kind of perhaps negative change coming in your life or not, or it could be a positive change too, so some kind of change in the matrix of your life. Okay, well, if you see yourself praying, as you might expect, that's great. Uh, if you see yourself answering a Kaddish, right, that's good. That means that you are guaranteed to have a place in the afterlife. If you dream yourself say, uh, answering a Kaddish in your prayers, that's a wonderful sign. And the if you see yourself saying Shema in your prayers, that you're guaranteed to have the Shechina, the divine presence upon you. So some, it's a good sign. It's a peregdula. If you see yourself putting on tefillin, that's a sign of greatness to come. And again, it uses a verse from the Tanakh to prove it. And Rabbi Eliezer was saying that specifically talking about the head tefillin, if you see yourself with head tefillin. And then it says, that if you pray in your dream, that's also a great sign. And then all kinds of other things like olives and olive trees. If you see small olives, it's good for business. You're going to have good business. If you see an olive tree, then that's a sign that you'll have many children. If you see, uh, or it could be a good reputation is spreading for you. If you see all kinds of things, if you see olive oil, then that means that you should anticipate more Torah greatness. Right? You'll understand the Torah better. So olives are, are good signs, depending on what, you, what kind of olives you see. And other good things. So a megalech will show if you see a, if you see yourself shaving. Okay, simanya fellow is a good sign, right? Shaving your head, shaving your beard. Shaving is like you know the, the Torah says that the people would shave for purification. The mitzvah person was a leper would shave the the nazir, the levim to be sanctified to the temple. They would have their bodies shaved. So it's a good sign if you see shaving, and not just for that person. Lo velechol mishpachto. It's a good sign for you and for your whole family. And so if you see yourself in a little boat, if you see yourself in a big boat, it's a good sign for you and your whole family. So these are all things that are also good signs. Classic dream. It's one of the common, I looked up the top 10 most common dreams that people have. And one of the top was you see yourself naked, right? Very classic dream. What does it mean to see yourself naked? So the sages say like this. First they say, if you see yourself going up on a roof in a dream, then that means that you're going, rising to greatness. And then they say, Yarad, Yored. But then if you see yourself coming down from the roof, then it's a sign that you're going to fall from greatness. But then Abaye Verava, another great duo of sages say, no, 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 don't worry. Kevan Sha'ala, Allah. Like once you've seen yourself rise, you're good. You're going to be great. Don't worry about coming down. It's fine. Even if you came down, you're still going to be great. Um, if you see yourself tearing your clothes, a koreb gadav, that's a good sign. Korim lo dino, that means that in heaven, if there was some kind of decree against you, it's being ripped up. Great sign. Aomedarum, if you're standing naked, what does that mean? So it depends. If you're standing naked, bebavel, meaning outside of Israel, it's a good sign, right? That means that you are naked. It means that you're sinless. Omed belochet, that you're sinless. But be warned, because if you're dreaming that you're naked in Israel, so if, that's not a good sign. Right? As long as you're dreaming that you're naked somewhere outside of Israel, it's a good sign. 
if you're dreaming and you're naked walking down the streets of Jerusalem, that's not a good sign. It means that you're lacking in mitzvahs. So then you have to strengthen yourself, do more mitzvahs, to fix that problem. Snakes is another common symbol that's in, in many dreams. So our sages interpret that in a very positive way. Okay, so it's a good sign for parnasa, for wealth. And if it bites you, even better. So so you'll have multiple wealth. Uh, your wealth will multiply even more greatly. Hargo, if you dream of a snake and you kill the snake, then you'll lose your wealth. But then Rav Sheshet says, nah, it's not. It's not like that. Uh, even if it's even if you kill the snake, it's fine. So anytime you see a snake in your dream, it's a good sign. No matter what happens, if it bites you, if you kill it, it's a good sign. It's good for your wealth. Uh, drinking, all kinds of drinking, is good is a good sign too. But for some people, if you drink uh, dream about drinking wine, that's not a good sign. And then there's all kinds of other things that the sages say: seeing certain people, seeing certain books. If you see King David, then you should expect to become more pious. If you see King Solomon, Shlomo, then that's a sign that you'll be wiser. If you see Ahav, who was one of the wicked kings, then you should worry that you might get some kind of heavenly punishment. And you see different prophets, or different books of prophets. If you see if you see one of the books of kings, that you're going to be great. If you see the book of Yechezkel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, you can, you're going to be wiser. Ishayahu, it's a pelanechama. Right? So different books of the Tanakh, if you see yourself seeing these books, read, studying these books in your dreams, that's, they're all pretty much good signs. Unless you're reading Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, Idag Minapuanut, because Jer Jeremiah is considered this doomsday prophet. So you should worry that maybe there's some punishment coming your way. So different signs. And finally, the idea is to always interpret dreams for the best. Like we said, that's the key kind of theme message here. Uh, Sha'al ben Dama, so this person ben Dama, the sage, the ben Achoto, the nephew of Shel Rabbi Ishmael, uh, he asked his uncle, Rabbi Ishmael, he saw that his cheeks melted off his face or were shed from his face. So he was frightened. It was a nightmare. And his uncle, Rabbi Ishmael, told him that there were people, Roman camps that were conspiring against you and they both died. So don't worry, it's a good sign. Similar case uh, with another couple of sages. I saw my nose fall off. Right? That's probably a dream that Michael Jackson had once. Uh, and he told them, he says, don't worry, it's a good sign, because the word af in the Torah also means that, like, af, charon af, it stands for anger, right? When a person gets angry, their, their nostrils flare. So he's saying it's a good sign. It means that God's anger has subsided from you. You're good. Uh, I saw my two hands, that they were cut off. Sounds like a horrible dream, having your hands cut off. Don't worry, it's a good sign. That means that you won't need your, the work of your hands anymore. You'll be wealthy, you won't have to work. It's a good sign. That I lost my two legs, God forbid. It's a good sign. It means you're going to be wealthier, you're not even going to need to walk anymore. You're going to drive on a ride a horse from place to place. So we always, the idea is to always interpret dreams for the best, share your dreams with somebody who you like and who you trust and who you know will interpret it in a positive way for you. And it'll come out that way. It'll be realized that that'll create a positive reality for you. And I just want to finish with this idea. I'll post this later, this interesting short video about scientists working currently on technology to record your dreams. And it's not science fiction. It's already science fact. We can do this uh, in a very rudimentary way. We have the technology today to read our brain waves, and scientists are already working on a big library of creating this interface between mind and machine and translating our brain waves and understanding what they mean. We've already done this really well with motion. We have bionic prosthetics. That's already become more and more common of people who. God forbid, if they're missing limbs, they can actually have prosthetics now wired into their brain and can control it with their brain, like just like they would any limb. So this technology is really rapidly accelerating. With motion, we've pretty much figured it out already, and now it's bigger things. So can we record, will we be able to record our dreams? Yes, and it's already been done in very rudimentary ways. 
So give it 10, 20, 30 years, who knows, maybe more, maybe less, but maybe you'll be able to walk into Costco and buy a dream recorder and think about how that will change the world, being able to record your dreams, being able to see what's going on in your kind of subconscious, unconscious. Maybe you'll be able to record your prophetic dreams now. Now you'll have, you'll have proof, right? Every time when you have a deja vu, you could search it up and say, hey, listen, I, I dreamt this. So think about what that would mean for a better understanding the soul, having more proof for prophecy, for spirituality, all kinds of things. Just think about what that can do because it's coming. Right? The day is coming when we will be able to record our dreams as you practice becoming a better dreamer as we all should be and uh, exploring that subconscious world and kind of getting in tune with our souls because remember every time you sleep the reason you're dreaming is because your soul is ascending to various worlds that's why we can get prophetic dreams that's why we can see information about other people dream about our friends see what's going on perhaps in their life we forget most of it and it gets mixed in with all the chaff but if we practice and we get really good at cleaning out, refining our dreams and seeing the prophecy in there. Uh, and, and maybe a day will come on that. We'll, we'll have some help from dream recorders. And we'll end here. Thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions and comments, we'll discuss now.